Hey everybody, Mark Catland, Mr. Saltwater Tank, coming to you from a VIP client build. This is the two 1,000 gallon reef tank build I got going on in this company's break room. Each tank, hey, I can actually do it tonight. Kind of not, see, that's what happens. You get cocky and then you, you can't get it right. There, each tank is 1,000 gallons, eight feet long, four feet front to back, four feet tall. Total of 1,000 gallons each. Now notice there's this little section here. These tanks are not gonna be tied together in any way. They each have their own filtration. They're each are set up independently of one another. So I'll be talking a little bit about this install tonight. And remember that we have our 10 year anniversary sale going on now at saltwateraquarium.com. Every day we're, pool, we're adding to our pool of freebies. If you place an order during the sale or you like or comment on the freebie that's posted for the day, then you're in the running to potentially win a freebie. We'll randomly pick orders uh, throughout the sale and throw in the freebies. The freebie that went live today, every 10th order gets a $25 store credit. So if you place an order at saltwateraquarium.com today, shop there by the way, Place an order at saltwateraquarium.com today. If your order number ends at a zero, then we will put in a $25 store credit in your account for you to use at a later date. So that's the uh, freebie that's going on now. Remember, we added 10 tridents to the freebie. Last Friday, we put in 100 HANA nitrate checkers in over the weekend. So we've got all kinds of freebies already going on. A pool of freebies that is getting built up um, so that's the 10 year anniversary sale that's going on now. Make sure that you are shopping with us, especially during this week. The sale ends this Sunday, May 2nd. So we got a freebies going on added every day. If you're just joining the stream, we've got 10 tridents already in the pool of freebies to give away. We've got a hundred Hanna nitrate checkers in there. Today, the freebie is every 10th order if your order number ends in zero, every 10th order gets a $25 store credit towards a future build. So make sure you check out our 10 year anniversary sale that's going on right now. All kinds of freebies getting added every day. We post a new one up every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time on our Facebook page. So make sure you check that out and um, all kinds of crazy uh, freebies going into the pool right now. So. That being said, this is a Q&A question. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the builds behind me first, and then I'll jump into your question. So these are each gonna be reef tanks. They're each a thousand gallons each, eight feet long, four feet tall, four feet front to back. Now, why four feet tall? I've talked a lot about four feet, the height, the challenges of four foot tall tanks. No concerns about lighting a four foot tall tank. The radions that are gonna go over these tanks have no problems penetrating that deep. This client liked the idea of a taller tank considering this is the executive break room here at this company. So they wanted four feet tall. Now there's some little tricks about how we're gonna service the tank. Can't show you that just yet because it's not done, but I will show you that likely in a future broadcast. Four foot front to back. Now those of you that are thinking about a tank build, you're wondering about how deep front to back you should go on your tank Here's what I advise. Go just about as deep front to back as you can. The difference between 24 to 30 is huge, 30 to 36 is huge. Now going beyond 36 inches front to back, that can be a challenge if you only have access to one side of the tank like here. There's no access to the front of these tanks. You can only access them from the back. So if you're doing an in-wall build, you only have access from the back doing a four foot deep tank Front to back can have its challenges. I would only do front four foot deep front to back if I have access from the front and I have access from the back. But 24, look, here's the thing about 24 foot wide tank. You really don't have a lot of options when it comes to aquascaping if you want to leave it off the back of your tank. Now look, a peninsula tank would not do a 24 inch wide peninsula because if you want to leave the rocks off the glass, then all you're going to get is a wall of rocks down the center, really on a 30 inch wide peninsula as well. Now, those of you with the three sides viewable or, or an in-wall where the tank is gonna, you're gonna have no access, you're not gonna be able to see the back of the tank, 
then you can put your aquascape farther towards the back of the tank and the narrowness doesn't really matter. The difference though between a 30 inch wide and a 36 inch wide tank, deep tank, is huge. You can get all kinds of depth, perception of more depth out of a 36 inch wide tank. So if you can do 36 inches wide, absolutely do it. You will be happy that you did. So check that out. Again, these tanks are 48 inches front to back. I don't have access to the front, but I do from the back uh, on a catwalk so that I can get in there and work on the tank if uh, need be. So that being said, um, oh, look at Ralph. Ralph says, I woke up at two in the morning just to see you. Greetings from Germany. Oh, look, check this out, Ralph. That's a uh, German brand. Got my Abyss shirt on here. Germans, German pump brand. There you go. They're actually, business are going on this tank. Each of these tanks is gonna have four Abyss pumps on it. Um, that's gonna power these things, two in the closed loop, and actually two return pumps. I'll talk about that in a future broadcast about why I'm doing that on these builds. So there you go, Rolf. Thanks for waking up early. Uh, have yourself some schnitzel. I don't know, 2 a.m. might be a little early for schnitzel, but you can get some of those really great pastries uh, that you guys have over there in Germany. Uh, Guten Morgen, by the way. Thanks for being with us. All right, let's answer a couple questions here. Let's jump into them uh, to get started. All right, Thomas. Thomas Carroy wants to know, he says, would a flame angel work in a 65 gallon reef tank? Okay, Thomas, here's the thing. Would a flame angel work in that gallon size of tank? Yes. Here's the thing about flame angels. They can get nippy not only towards other coral, other fish, but also coral. And there are smaller angels. So if you decide that they're not working out for you, they start eating one of your favorite corals, or they start bothering some of your fish, getting them out of your tank can be a real challenge. I like the flame angel colors, that they're absolutely beautiful fish, but if they cause a problem, you're very likely not gonna get it out of your 65 gallon tank. You probably won't even get it out of a 30 gallon tank unless you do something major, like drain a lot of water out and remove some rocks where you can easily catch that fish. They're very good at hiding, even though they're really pretty, Borderline fish on the fringe for me. If you wanted to give that a shot, Thomas, go for it. Let me know how it's working. Just keep in mind, if it's not working out, you're probably not gonna get that fish out of your tank. All right, let's see. What other questions do you guys have? Uh, Jared wants to know, am I getting in the tanks to service them? Well, Jared, these are gonna be reef tanks. These actually aren't gonna be an insert tank. They will be reef tanks. So the thing about reefs, like I tell people, especially with this client is, you don't really want to mess with them. We don't want to get in them much. Very minimally do we want to get in these tanks. So we're not going to plan on getting them into them unless we absolutely have to. I don't like to put my hands in the tank more than I absolutely have to. So I'm not going to mess with them. I just want them to do their thing. All right, Trevor, great question here. Trevor says, could the exclusive use of pellets have caused a green hair algae outbreak? Uh, getting slowly better using frozen food. All right, Trevor, here's the thing, pellets, bio pellets will grow bacteria which will then eat algae um, in your tank. They're going to outcompete the algae. The bacteria will grow. It'll outcompete the algae for nutrients. So having bio pellets uh, that will then cause a hair algae outbreak? No, it would actually work the other way out. If you had bio pellets, you shouldn't have a green hair algae outbreak because those bio pellets are much better at consuming nutrients than algae ever will be. So a lot of times people who used to run bio pellets and had a refugium, they would notice that their refugiums would die off because the bio pellets are out. What? This is what happens when you give your helper a break. He goes and sits in the tank and he uses that as the break room. How's that? That's, that's Kit, my helper. Um, what the heck? I'm on the broadcast. We're on break. Yeah. So yes, Jared, we're kind of be getting in the tank. We got to get in the tank, octoscape it, and to work on it like my assistant kit is doing right now. You got to get a ladder to get down in there. Why not? All right, Miguel. Oh boy, here we go. Here's one of those uh, tank police questions. Would you put a 33 inch gym tank in a 37 cube tank? I would not, Miguel. Here's why. Those tanks are used to running around the reef following things around, eating algae all the time. So 
putting that gem tank in a small tank, even if it's a smaller specimen like you have, it's still going to want some space to roam. I would not put your three inch gem tank in your 37 cube tank. I would use that as a great opportunity to upgrade. Everybody loves an upgrade. Why not upgrade your tank? All right, while we're talking about fish, Brandon wants to know, he wants an Achilles tang. Is it worth a headache for an awesomeness of one? No, I would not. The Achilles tangs, not a, I like them. Look, they're really beautiful fish. However, I would not um, put that, I would not go for that. They are likely prone to disease. They also need a lot of space to run around. And they're an Acanthoris tang. Acanthoruses are known to have the worst attitude when it comes to tang. They can run around and beat up stuff uh, in your tank. So I would not, um, I would not go for an Achilles. If you like Achilles, go for an Achilles gold or hybrid. That's what I would do instead of getting a straight Achilles tank. The Achilles gold rim hybrid, really beautiful fish. Love that fish. I have one in my tank and they're more robust than Achilles because it's a hybrid. Great question. Ooh. Okay. Hmm. That would be a hard one without knowing all the fish. So Patrick, I would have to see your fish list if I was going to advise you on um, stocking orders. That's a hard one because picking fish for your tank, what, when, which ones do you pick? When do you put them in? Like there's so many variables with that. I mean, someone would have to write an algorithm to manage that. You put in this fish, it can affect all these other decisions about what fish that you could have. But if you put that fish in last, that may change things. If you put this fish in first, that may change things over here. It's a complex task to pick fish for your tank and then how are you gonna stock them? I, that would be a tough one to really have to know the list um, to get in on it. Oh, look at this. Awesome, someone's shopping the sale. Got the 10 year anniversary t-shirt today. One of your orders, uh, it's so nice. Wife made me order more stuff to get her one too. That's Awesome. Our 10 year anniversary shirt um, is up. You place an order for $100 or more. The shirt is free. While supplies last, just add the shirt, pick your size, add it to your cart. If your order is over $100 or free, then that's the freebie on your order. Thanks for shopping with us. Uh, and that's awesome that your wife made you order more. Maybe if you order today, then you got that 10th order special where every 10th order, if your order ends in a zero, you get a $25. Uh, gift certificate towards a future purchase over going on right now with our 10 year anniversary sale over at saltwateraquarium.com. Celebrating 10 years of business. Thank you all for your support, whether it be yesterday, today, or 10 years ago, or anywhere in between. Uh, thanks you all for all that support. All right, here we go. Let's go back. This is fish questions tonight. I dig it. I love fish. I like coral too. My tank is coming together in terms of coral. So right now I'm really digging all the attention that I'm getting to put towards the fish because I'm not distracted by the coral. Lewis, what are my thoughts on two blue throat, two, two blue throat trigger males in 125 gallon? All right, Lewis, I would get a male and female pair. I would not put two males in that 125 gallon tank. Prone to fighting, 125 gallons isn't that big of a tank for a, cross, for a blue throat anyway. If you want two of them, get a mated pair and put them in your tank. Here's the tip though. If you get a female and you get a male separate from one another, I would try to pair them up before you put them in the tank. They don't always take to one another. You can put them in something like a 40 gallon breeder for a couple days, put a egg crate divider between them, let them look at each other, see how they're doing. Do they like each other? Do they hate each other? Are they trying to attack the egg crate? If they don't settle down after a couple days, they're not gonna make a pair. You don't want to have those two fighting in your tank Triggers are definitely a fish that you're not going to get out of the tank. They lock themselves in the rock. So if you want to get a pair, ideally get a mated pair. A lot of Aquarius divers and sometimes have a mated pair up. If you get a male and a female separate, try them out in a smaller tank with a divider before you put them in your tank. All right, let's see here. Hmm, great question. Here's a fun one. We were just talking about this, my tank buddy Jack, over the weekend. Waterhouse Jason says, I know stability is the key, but what is stable? What is an acceptable swing in numbers, alkalinity, and calcium? All right, 
here's the fun thing about this one, Jason. I have found that older tanks are more tolerant of parameter swings than younger tanks. Younger tanks are basically immature kids. You say something to them, they fly off the handle, they kick and scream. Yes, wave to the audience, Kit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, older tanks are more tolerant of swings than younger tanks. Okay, but what's considered stable? What's considered an acceptable swing? For the most part, I say half a dKH of alkalinity a day is okay with me. But calcium and magnesium, number one, they shouldn't be swinging wildly unless you do a water change in your mix-up salt. You do a large water change in your mix-up salt. doesn't have anywhere close to the same parameters as your tank that's going off. And you shouldn't see a calcium swing from 400 to 500 in a day or two unless something is really off. I mean, your corals aren't going to... Okay, so let me back up. Let's say you have a fully grown in tank with lots of hard corals, your calcium reactor or your dosing goes offline, your calcium might drop from 500 to 400 in a day or two. Is that gonna affect things in your tank? Probably not. Like my, your, your growth might slow down, but I don't expect things to crash. I don't expect your corals to all of a sudden start dying because your calcium went from 500 to 400. Same with magnesium, if it moves around a little bit, I'm not concerned about it. What I am more concerned about when it comes to swings and stability, alkalinity, we talked about that. Half a dKH for me a day is okay. Temperature is a big one. If your temperature goes from 75 to 80 in a day or down the other direction, okay, then I'm gonna get concerned. Then I would expect some kind of repercussions in your tank. Here's the other thing you gotta keep in mind, Waterhouse, about having parameter swings. It's likely that you're not going to see an effect on your tank for a couple of days, if not a week or two down the line. It's usually not immediate unless it's really, really major. So if you have a tank perimeter swing, then a week later or two weeks later, you start seeing some color loss or some death. That's likely related to your swing. Just know you're gonna have some gap in time there before you actually see something that's wrong unless your um, parameters are big. Like if your temperature goes from 80 to 65 in a day, you're probably going to see some immediate results. If your stability, your alkalinity goes from nine and a half to six in a day, then you might see immediate issues. All right. Great question. Um, again, though, keep in mind, older tanks I found to be more um, forgiving when it comes to swings than older tanks. Youngers are, have a harder time with it than older. All right. Aaron, oh boy, moving a tank. Aaron says, I'm moving my 75 gallon to a new home next week. Congrats on the new home. Will rustling the sand around, moving everything, release a tons of nutrients and cause issues. Also concerned about how long I have to wait for things to settle before fish go back in. All right, here's the thing, Aaron. Whenever I move a tank, I put in new sand. Your old sand is full of nasties, you'd be surprised, even if it's six months old, how much stuff is stuck in the sand. You move the tank, two issues here. Number one, saltwater tanks, well, I mean, back up. Well-built aquariums are made to handle the weight of the water and the rock and the stuff in them. However, they're not necessarily made to do that and being moved around. It's a different type of force. So by leaving the sand in your tank, it can be excess weight in your tank, which can cause issues. So I, that's one reason I get in out. The other one is say all the stuff that's junked, that's this, the junk that's stuck in your sand. So sand is not that expensive. Take it out of your tank, throw it away, get new sand. Now, if you wanna preserve a little bit of it because there's microfauna, microflora um, in your sand, look, do that, take a couple cups, put that in. The other thing about moving your tank is it's really best if you don't take your tank down, move it, and then put everything back in it. Because here's the thing about tank moves, and it happens every single time. It's happened to me. I've seen it with other professionals that move tanks. Your tank is going to get upset at you. It's going to kick and scream. It's going to complain. It will not be happy. So with that in mind, the first thing you want to do is any fish that you really like or any coral that you really like, take them out of your tank. Now, fish you can't frag. Corals you can. I highly recommend, if you're going to move your tank, if you have some large LPS colony that you can't frag out, put it in your buddy's tank that you know is stable and is doing well. Get that thing out of there. It's not worth the risk. If you have SBS, 
clip some frags, put them in a couple buddies' tanks. That way you have some backup, especially if you have larger SPS colonies. They're likely not gonna handle that move well. So by giving yourself some backup, by placing frags in other tanks, you've got a bank that you can come back on if your mother colony dies. Definitely, definitely do that. If you have a favorite fish, you can get it out of your tank without causing a lot of stress. Here's a hint, when you drain the tank down to move it, that's a great time to remove the fish. You can do that. The other thing about this is, by taking things out, especially if you can take everything out and put it somewhere else, even if it's like a temporary tank, you're giving yourself the benefit of time. You don't have to stress to move, you don't have to rush it and be stressed during the move, because you're like, look, I started this morning at seven, I've gotta get this thing up pretty quick because I gotta get everything back in it. You can move it over as quickly or as slow as you want. You can take your time. Maybe you wanna change your plumbing or do some upgrade on your tank. You're giving yourself the benefit of time. The other thing about tank moves that I always tell people is, it's going to take longer than you think. It's going to take lots longer than you think. So playing on that, give yourself some options by not having to take down your tank and immediately set it back up again. Here's a hint. When you have to move your tank, that is a fantastic time to upgrade your tank. Look, you have a 75 gallon, if you go from a 75 to a 90, a 75 to a 120 is a great jump, do it. To me, that's the only reason to move a saltwater tank because it's a pain in the tail. Use this opportunity to do it. This will let you hopefully keep everything in your 75, build up the new tank, move everything over in time. Look, even if you could, you could go from your old 75 to a new 75, Maybe you want to go with a different overflow setup, you want to swap out the stand, do it. Give yourself the time, if at all possible. And of course, take out your prize fish, frag your prize corals. Very likely your tank is going to be happy with you. Corals are going to bleach out, you might lose some fish. Just playing on that um, happening for your tank. All right. Oh, here we go, Miguel. Are bio pellets a thing of the past? Mm, not really in the sense that they are still an effective way to manage nutrients in your saltwater tank. Now, they're certainly not as popular as they were before. Mm, five, six years ago, they were all the rage. Bio pellets, bio pellet reactors, everyone was talking about them. Now, more people talk about refugiums. Bio pellets can certainly still work. I love carbon dosing tanks. It's way more effective than a refugium is. So definitely not in my mind. I will use a bio pellet when the tank needs it. How do I know the tank needs it? It has a nutrient issue. Here's the thing. Some of those people that tried bio pellets, they put them on their tank. They didn't have any nutrient issues. They had low nitrates and low phosphates to begin with. Then the bio pellets went ahead and stripped the rest of the nitrates and the phosphates out. Then they had issues with their tanks because their tank was super low nutrients. So if you don't have a nutrient issue, which to me for a mixed reef is nitrates over 10, phosphates over 0.1, you don't need bio pellets. There's not that much nutrients in your tank to get them to grow, so you don't need to add them. So add them when your tank tells you. If you've watched enough of my streams or my videos, you know I'm big on that. Let your tank tell you what it wants. For example, my new thousand gallon reef at home, my nitrates are at 0.5, my phosphates are at 0.01, anyway, 0.01 to 0.03. I don't have any nutrient controls. I don't even have a refugium up on my tank because I don't need it. I don't have a nutrient issue. In fact, I like a little more nutrients in the tank, so I am not running any kind of nutrient control on the tank now. All right, Jared, who knows about Mr. Mulligan, Jared wants to know how deep of a sand bed do I recommend for a blue spot jawfish, and will they do all right in a 78 degree tank? All right, Jared, sand bed depth, two to three inches is fine. Those guys will build themselves a little burrow. A lot of times they'll move sand around if they feel like they need it. So I'm okay with a two to three inch sand bed. You don't need anything deeper. You don't need anything shallower than two. I wouldn't go any shallower than two. And I don't like going over three. You're not close to the deep sand bed range, but to me, you're wasting a lot of real estate in your tank because you're putting up all the sand bed. Now, here's the thing in the area that you can try. Look, you're dealing with a fish. You may hope that it goes somewhere, and then it may end up going somewhere else. But if you want to build up a little dome for it, maybe extra sand bed depth under a rock, maybe even start a little tunnel form. When you put it in your tank, kind of encourage him to go to that area. 
you can try that and maybe he likes that home better and give it a shot. Now, will they do all right, will they do all right in a 78 degree tank? I would say yes to that. I've talked to a lot of professionals about blue spot jawfish and they feel like most of the success really comes with how they're collected. Are they collected well as opposed to what the actual temperature uh, is uh, in the tank? Good question um, for that. Good luck with the jawfish. Um, lots of fish questions tonight. I'm digging it. James, I'm about to start a Red Sea. That's Red Sea is what it means by RS350. You've got a yellow tang I'm going to be moving over, but also would like a small blue tang. Do you think the yellow tang will attack it? All right, James, you're probably all right between those two types of tangs because they're not in the same genus. However, the thing about blue tangs, I'm assuming you're talking about a hippo tang. I found once they get big, they can be bullies. They also start to eat coral. I've had issues with them um, eating zoanthid corals. So, look, I like the yellow over the blue, especially considering the yellows are more rare now since the collection of Y has been shut down. I would keep your yellow and um, not pick up the small blue. That would be my recommendation. All right, for those of you who are just joining us, remember we have our 10 year anniversary sale happening right now at saltwateraquarium.com. We are building up a pool of freebies during our 10 year sale. We've already got 10 tridents in the pool. We put 100 Hanna nitrate checkers. We've got TDO pellet uh, in there as well. And today, every 10th order, it gets a $25 gift certificate for use for a future order. So if you, order, if you place an order today, or if you place one after or during the stream and your order number ends in a zero, we'll go back in and we'll add that to your account. So next time you place an order, you can use that $25 gift certificate. So don't forget about the sale, it's happening now. We've got all kinds of freebies that we're digging up there. Um, don't miss out on the opportunity for the sale. Okay. All right, David wants to know, look at this, it's upgrade night, I love it. You're going from a 68 to 180 gallon soon and you love your sand sifting gobies but you've lost some to starvation how hard is it to keep them without feeding the substrate? All right, David, I've kept sand sifting gobies for years. I've never had to do anything to the substrate. They've always eaten prepared foods. They've always eaten frozen foods. So I haven't had an issue with them just trying to live off what's in the sand bed. Now, there can be challenges, get them frozen food if you have a lot of other fish in your tank, especially aggressive fish, aggressive eaters like tangs and antheas because often those sand sifters won't rise up much into the water column to eat. So you may have to squirt some food right in front of them, get some food in the flow, I keep my pumps on and try to push that food right in front of them so they will go on and eat. So, but I have not had any sand sifters that won't eat any kind of prepared food. If this is something if I was gonna pick up my sand sifters at a local fish store, I would want to see them eat some kind of frozen food before I took them home. Now this is true with sand sifting gobies, or really any goby that's out there. Go ahead and make sure they're eating uh, before you bought them. And um, if they're not eating food at the local fish store, I'm not gonna buy it. Is that Jerry Garcia in the tank behind me, Trevor? Uh, no, that's my helper kit. Uh, to me, he looks more like Ted Kaczynski, but uh, he could probably swing for Jerry Garcia, sure. All right. David wants to know, is eight fish too many in a 60 gallon cube with a sump? All right, David, depends on the type of fish. Eight tangs, absolutely. Eight chromis, no. Eight clownfish, no. Eight dotty backs, nah, probably not. Look, it's like one fish of one, how am I gonna say that? Let me back up. Fish are not created equal, especially when it comes to bio load. Tangs produce a lot more waste in your tank than a goby would. Even if the goby's four inches and the tang is two inches, that goby is still gonna produce much less waste than a tang would. So it depends on what type of fish are going that make up that H that you're looking to put in um, to your 60 gallon cube. Lewis wants to know, any advice on the right amount of food to feed in the frequency of feeding? How do you know if you're overfeeding your fish buddies? Okay, Lewis. Overall, I like to feed two to three times a day and I like to mix up the type of food that I'm feeding. In my case, my fish get nori in the morning. Now in my case also, I have to put in half a sheet of nori 
so that they all get a chance to eat. You may not need that much food, but I do nori in the morning, and then I do frozen food in the afternoon. That's my daily routine. If I'm home, then I might slip them a little bit more nori in the afternoon because I have a lot of tangs. Sorry, in the evening. Also, if you want, if you can, especially now that a lot more of us are home, let's say you're gonna do just frozen. Do a little bit of frozen in the morning, do some in the afternoon, and then you can do some in the evening. That's great too. Spacing out your feedings a couple times during the day is better than one big one. Now, what do you feed them? Part of that is knowing your fish. Certain fish have certain tastes. For example, my tangs only eat purple nori. That's it. They have no interest in green, no interest in brown. So that's all I feed them. How did I find that out? I put in some green and they ate a couple bites and looked at me like, no, I'm not interested. Put in the brown, they never touched it. Purple, it's like crack. As soon as I put, like, come up to the tank with it in my hand, they go ballistic. They absolutely mow it down. So make sure that when you're feeding, you're not just feeding, putting food in the tank and that's it. You want to watch them and make sure that they're eating what you're feeding them. And it may be that certain type of fish are eating it, but other types of fish aren't. So then you have to adjust your diet so that everyone is getting a chance to eat. They are eating what you offer them every chance that you get to feed. You can feed twice a day, that's great. To me, that's a minimum. Three times a day is even better. Look, if you can do four, I'm not gonna do four big feedings throughout the day. I would take what I would feed in one big feeding, then I'm gonna slice it up roughly into four different times and put that in the tank. All right. VA wants to know, how do we get a discount for the 10 year anniversary? Is there a code? All right, VA, here's the thing. We're doing a couple different things during the sale. Sorry, during the anniversary. Number one, we don't necessarily have a sale uh, going on. We do have double war points on non-map items. You spend $100 or more, then you can grab yourself the limited edition saltwateraquarium.com t-shirts. What we're doing mainly in this 10 year anniversary celebration is that we're adding a, we've got a pool of freebies that we're building up. And then we're pulling randomly from those freebies, putting those freebies in people's boxes. Now, if you place an order today, your order ends in a zero, then we're gonna put a $25 gift certificate in your cart so you can use it towards a future order. Um, but there's not necessarily any discounts going on uh, during the sale. It's during the sale, I keep saying that. During the anniversary uh, celebration. All right, here we go, let's see. Hmm. Matthew wants to know, I found one Aptasia in my tank. Congrats on just finding one, by the way. As soon as I found it, I took the rock out. Should I bleach the rock? If so, for how long? All right. If you found one Aptasia in your tank, Matthew, and you absolutely don't see anything else, what I would do is I would cut that piece of rock out, get some bone cutters and just cut around where that Aptasia is and remove it. I wouldn't bleach the rock, try to kill everything on that rock because you just found one Aptasia. Now, it may be that you found one and there's some other ones in your tank that you can't see. However, I'm not gonna sacrifice that whole rock because I just found one Aptasia. Now, if that rock is absolutely overrun, then I may do it. But one Aptasia to me isn't something that's worth bleaching the whole rock. Also, if you just wanna take that rock out, you can get some hydrogen peroxide, and squirt it right on that Aptasia, leave it there for 10 minutes, it will fry the Aptasia, then you can put the rock back in your tank without any concerns. All right, oh, look at this. Marcus, wish the new people who are reefers. Check it out, Marcus, they're all on the stream right now. These are people that are reefers. And if you're on Facebook, we understand not everyone wants to be, but if you are on Facebook, make sure you check out our Saltwater Insiders group. There's a whole bunch of people in there that are reefers, Marcus, people you can hang out with, ask questions, and talk about. All right, let's see here. Oh. Hmm, look at that. We have an upgrade, 75 to 120. What a great size upgrade. All right, let's run for two more questions here. Steve, Steve's with us every Monday. Thanks for being with us, Steve. What's your favorite fish to stir the sand or do you think they're worthwhile? All right, Steve, I really like the pink spot gobies. I have found they stir the sand some, but not too much. Some gobies, like Gola head gobies, sleeper head gobies, they all have different names. Um, they often will go get way too active in stirring, move sand back and forth across from your tank, bury your coral. The pink spots I found 
don't do that. They say they, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. They're the middle bear. It's like they not too big, not too small, not too hard, not too soft, but just right. So I like the pink spot gobies. Um, that's what I do. All right, Blue Reef. Let's go. That was a quick question. Let's go with two more. Blue wants to know: It's good to run a carbon 24/7 in an SBS tank. Sure. I don't have an issue running carbon in any saltwater tank, especially not an SPS tank. Now, what you can do if you're not running it blue and you want to start running carbon, and let's say the calculator that we have on our website says you need to add two cups of carbon. Start with half a cup. Put it in your tank. Don't change anything else. Sorry, don't put it in the tank. Put it in a media reactor is my preferred way of running carbon. Put it in there. Make sure it's not tumbling. Wait a week. Make sure there's no massive change in your tank, everything going good. Put in another half cup and see what happens. You don't have to go all in from the get-go. Start on half of the recommended and see what you get, especially with uh, a more sensitive SPS tank. All right. Hmm. Sylvester wants to know, I'm starting a new 180 gallon and a half water box what biomedia do I recommend? Live Rock, Marine Pure, Brightwell Export. All right, Sylvester, depending on how much Live Rock you're planning on using in your tank, it very likely is going to get the job done in terms of uh, biomedia. Now, I'm not a fan of the minimal aquascape uh, that I see that's gotten very popular where people have like three rocks in their tank and that's it. I, the dollar, the dollar, one pound of rock per gallon is a rough rule for me. I'm usually somewhere around um, three quarters of a pound per gallon. Here's a hint. What I'll do is I'll buy, if I have a 300 gallon tank, I'll buy about 300 pounds of rock. That way when I'm aquascaping the tank, I have choices. If you don't have enough rock or you have a minimal amount of rock, then you have less choices for aquascaping. So I'm okay buying more than what I need. Then I have more choices, more rock to pull from. I might not use all that rock, but I found I'll use it at some point, or I'll trade it with a buddy or something. More rock is more beneficial to me, especially when it comes to choosing your aquascape, but how much do I actually put in the tank? It's usually around three quarters of a pound per gallon of tank. And live rock absolutely gets it done. I don't need to add anything else to the tank. Um, I also don't run my tanks with lots and lots of big fish. I'm a fan of smaller fish, so I'm not overstocking my tank. As well. All right, let's see here. Hmm. Hmm. What's my secret? <laughs> All right. Paul wants to know would a purple tank and a convic tank be okay together in a Mega Matrix 120? Great tank, by the way. Thanks for uh, watching the series if you've seen it. If not, check out the Mega Matrix 120 series we did over at the saltwateraquarium.com YouTube channel. Uh, 120 gallon tank, it was a great tank, four feet long, two feet wide, two feet tall. It's what I call a big, small tank. It doesn't take up a lot of room. Probably if you bring the tank home, your spouse is gonna look at it and freak out because it doesn't feel, it doesn't look that big. I mean, it's a sizable tank, don't get me wrong, but it's not like you bring home an eight footer and be like, what do you think? They're probably gonna freak out. So a con purple tank and a convict tank in a 120, I would be okay with that. I would put them in together uh, to put, as opposed to putting one in and then the other one in. I would also put them in an acclimation box, ideally in a box that has some kind of divider. Let them check each other out, see how they're gonna do before you release them into the tank. Because if they start fighting, one of them is gonna win. Probably would not surprise me if they fought to the death. You don't wanna have to deal with that um, in your tank, especially your new one. Uh, congrats on the Mega Matrix 120. Let me know how the fish go if you get them. With that, I'm gonna jump back into work. I gotta get done on this closed loop system and uh, we will go, we'll be back with you. I think we're back next Monday. Quick check, while we're doing that, don't forget about our 10 year anniversary sale going on right now. That ends next Sunday, um, May 2nd. So I fly out tomorrow, well, oh. so. Next week, we will be back with you for a live stream. We may have to shift the time a little bit. We will let you know about that. Uh, remember, we had the 10-year anniversary celebration going on right now, saltwateraquarium.com. 
We're building up those pool of freebies. If you place an order with us today and your order number ends in zero, you've got yourself a $25 gift certificate that you can use towards a future purchase. With that, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm gonna bounce on here and get back to work. Be a long day today, but that's all right. That's part of it. I will catch you next week. Have a great night. Thanks everyone for your questions. And of course, thanks for shopping with us.